Okay, let's talk about the second part of completable futures where we'll go in more detail about how all those methods get grouped together in the completable futures framework. Remember, they all come through the completable futures class, which has over 60 methods in it, which is pretty daunting at first. But when you kind of break it down, you see that those methods break down into a number of different categories. We have completion stage methods, which are the bulk of the methods. There are probably like 40 or so of them that are so-called completion stage methods. There's another maybe eight or so that are basic methods. Then we have four or so factory methods, a handful of arbitrary arity methods, and then probably three or four exception methods. So we'll talk about each of these different things and I'll help you see how they fit together. The other thing we'll do in this section, what well, we should get through this today, is talk about the relationship between Java 8 completable futures and so-called reactive programming, which is a very popular paradigm for writing code these days. And you'll learn a lot about that if you start writing a lot of uh, functional programming systems or you work with things like uh, um, Kotlin or Rx Java or Clojure and so on. Those are touted and, and rightly so reactive programming languages, frameworks, models, and so on. And Java 8 also supports features of that too. Okay, so let's talk about these, these groups of methods. So basically we have completion stage methods and arbitrary arity methods. We'll look at those two groups of methods first. And you can take a look here at uh, a nice link that kind of helps explain all these things in, in more detail. Okay, so there's a bunch of methods. In fact, there are about four of them, or four classes of methods four groups of methods, not classes of methods, that has a different meaning, four groups of methods that will be triggered when a single previous stage completes. And here are the methods, then apply, then compose, then accept, and then run. And I'm not going to go through them in great detail right now. I just want to alert you to the fact that they exist. We will go through them in great detail shortly. But those are what the, those are the methods that will get triggered when one stage completes before this stage gets called. So as a, as a typical example, you might say supply async, which will go ahead and start something running in the background. And then you would say then apply, which says after that async operation finishes, then run this action. And then apply gets triggered after one thing finishes, the, the supply async method that ran before it. And so this tells you what the parameters are passed in, what the return values are, and what the behavior is. Um, again, I'm not going to talk in detail about these things now, but we're going to show examples of a bunch of them. For each of these methods, they, there's also a corresponding async version. So there's then apply, and there's then apply async. There's then compose, and there's then compose async. And the only real difference here is that the versions of these methods that don't have async at the end are obliged to run the action, the next action, the dependent action that gets triggered after the previous action finishes in the same thread of control where the previous action completed. So if you start something in the background with supply sync, and then you have a then apply method, when the background thread finishes with the, the then async part, then that same thread will then run the then apply part. Conversely, if you have the async methods, that says, just pick some other thread in the thread pool and let that other thread run the result. So that allow you potentially to have more things running in parallel at perhaps slightly higher overhead. So your mileage may vary. It's always good to experiment to see which is the best approach. A lot of people say you should always use the uh, async versions of these things. I think it depends on whether you're doing server-side programming or client-side programming and how many cores you've got and other factors that you probably need to experiment with. But that's the main difference between the async versions and the non-async versions. And we're going to take a look at then apply, then compose, and then accept. Those will be the three things we're going to show examples of as we go through this. There are also a bunch of methods that work when two previous stages complete. So you can think of this as the, the AND method. You're probably all familiar with the concept of an AND, right? A logical AND, when you say this AND that. 
And what that says is, you know, don't run the, the statement until both parts of the condition are true. So that's what is going on. And the and methods, which are these, only let their action be triggered when both parts are two previous stages complete successfully. And we've got a couple of examples, then combine, then accept both, and run after both. Those are some methods you can see that they take by functions or by consumers, um, which means there's, there's two things that are coming in, and they will typically apply the results of the previous stages and then create a future to a result. And sometimes you have a future with a result, sometimes you have just a future with no result. We'll talk more about that later as well. And once again, you can see that we have the async versions of each of these two. We're going to show then combine in the example we'll look at. But it's easy enough, once you understand then combine, it's easy enough to do then accept both or run after both. Well, as you might expect, in addition to having and, we also have or. So what does or do? Well, or basically says there are two stages that happen before this one. And whichever one happens to complete first, then take the result of that and do something with it. So it's an or, right? So it's either or as opposed to both and, which is what the previous thing did. And once again, there's a couple of different methods. There's apply to either and accept either and run after either. And we're going to take a look at accept either. And uh, these are kind of fun because you can use them to do some computation when either something, either of two other asynchronous computations finish. So the example I'll show you later, as, as you guys probably all remember from your data structures course, there are different ways in order to be able to do sorting, right? There's merge sort, there's quick sort, there's heap sort, there's insertion sort, there's bubble sort, there's shell sort. There's dozens of different sorting algorithms. Which ones are the best? Well, the answer to that question is it depends. Sometimes it's quick sort. Sometimes it's insertion sort. Sometimes it's merge sort. You don't always know just by staring at some input whether quick sort's going to work better than merge sort or heap sort or whatnot. So rather than sit there and try to do some kind of you know, funky mathematical analysis, you can simply take advantage of the fact that there's so many cores available. And you can say, sort your list with both of these approaches, you know, quick sort and merge sort. And whichever one finishes first, take the results and do something with it. Right? So hey, if you've got an embarrassingly large number of cores, why not use them to just do everything in parallel and just kind of pick the one that finishes first and use its result? So I'll show you an example that illustrates how to do that. And then the final piece of the puzzle here are what are called the, the arbitrary arity methods. And these complete after some or all of n completable futures complete. And you can see here we have all of and any of. Those are the two methods. And as the name suggests, all of takes a variable length number of parameters, like an array, and it returns a future that completes only when all of the futures in the array complete. And any of, as the name suggests, takes an array of completable futures. And it will complete when any of those futures complete. So you can think of these as, to some extent, a generalization of the or and and mechanisms we just talked about, except now they work on n of them as opposed to just two, which is what the ones did before. And we'll show an example of, of all of and see how that works. It turns out, for various reasons, that programming all of and any of out of the box is kind of awkward and ugly and nasty. And so you're usually better off writing some kind of wrapper or adapter around these things. And I'll show you some cool examples. In fact, we'll see some things like future collector that makes it really easy to, to do this so that you don't have to worry about the details of how it all works under the hood. The other thing you can do with exceptions, or sorry, with the uh, completable futures, is you can program them to handle exceptional conditions. And this is really important, because invariably things go wrong. In fact, this is one of the pillars of the reactive programming model. You need to make it resilient to errors. And so they build into the completable futures framework some really interesting exception handling mechanisms. And I'll give you a summary of them right now. And then I'll come back and, and give you more details about how they work later. So there are three that we care about when complete 
and when complete async, handle and handle async, and exceptionally. And each of these behaves in ever so different ways. Um, they take different parameters, they have different behaviors, they have different return values, and so on and so forth. You take a look at this link for some descriptions about how to program the different mechanisms. And I'll show you lots of examples that illustrate how to use these different mechanisms when you write code. So we'll look at all three of them. Okay, the next and probably the last part of this thing will be the comparison between completable futures and so-called reactive programming. So what is reactive programming? Well, if you take a look here at this Wikipedia link, you will find a link to the reactive manifesto. Nothing in uh, computer science is, is really something cool unless they have a manifesto, right? So there's like the Agile manifesto, and there's the GNU manifesto, and there's probably, you know, go-to considered harmful manifesto. And you always think of, you know, like, Che Guevara with his cool beret having a manifesto, right? So there's a reactive manifesto. And there are four primary things that are necessary in order for something to fall under the category of a reactive programming model. And those things are you need to be responsive, and what that means is you don't block. You need to be elastic, which means you can just keep sort of, you know, throwing more cores at the problem and your system will automatically and elastically auto scale to handle the number of resources that you have. You have resilient, which means if something goes wrong, your whole program doesn't grind to a halt and blow up. And the other point here is that these things are typically message or event driven. And again, that kind of goes along with this concept of not blocking. So those are the four primary precepts for reactive programming. So let's take a look at uh, you know, why you might want to do this. Well, one of the reasons why you might want to do this is you don't want to block thread. So as we talked about before, whenever you do blocking, it underutilizes the number of processor cores because you're stuck blocking. You're not able to take advantage of the inherent parallelism on a platform. And to some extent, your program structure becomes complicated because you've got these things blocked and you aren't handling stuff in a consistent way. So no blocking, right? That's, that's what that's supposed to imply, no blockers. Another problem that you get yourself into if you're not careful is you end up changing threads a lot because the minute you start blocking, then you have to have context switching and that incurs overhead and it gets complicated. Um, so one of the things we'll see is that, uh, well, let me first complete this. So it turns out that completable futures allows you to avoid blocking threads. So that's, that's why that's relevant. Likewise, Java, the Java 7 and Java 8 fork join pool make it relatively straightforward to avoid changing threads unnecessarily. And they go to great lengths to make it optimal so that things run in cores or threads where they have an affinity to the cache that's important to making your program run uh, efficiently. And for more information about that issue, take a look at Doug Lee's paper about the fork join framework, which talks about some of the cache affinity management models. And the basic idea is you try to do things in, in one thread that have an affinity for that thread, and then you have other threads that steal work out of other parts of the queues, and we'll talk more about that later. And then the, the third thing, which is also provided through all that exception handling support we just talked about, was the ability to avoid so-called crippling failures. So just because one part of the system doesn't work doesn't mean everything else stops and the whole system grinds to a, to a halt. Um, anybody know what this is, by the way? Anybody here ever see the classic Terminator 2 movie? Oh my god, this is horrible. Um, that's the, the T-1000 Terminator who uh, was able to adapt when he was blown up or shot or whatever. He would just like absorb the, the attack and keep going. So, um, very cool movie. With Java 9, which by the way came out like a week ago at long, long last, there's a new set of features that are now part of Java, which we may or may not get to later in the semester. If I can find some time to make a bunch of slides and show a bunch of new examples, we'll cover it. Um, these are what are called reactive streams and the flow API. And this adds support for publish subscriber mechanisms. And so what you can basically do is you can have classes that are or objects that are publishing events and then they go through a series of transformations asynchronously, of course. And then you can have subscribers that 
subscribe to those events. And that way you can have these pipelines of event flows that are transformed through a streams-like mechanism. And uh, if anybody here has ever programmed with Rx Java, that's the typical model that Rx Java provides. So now Java 9 provides this so-called reactive streams infrastructure meant to make it possible to write Rx Java more efficiently in an, or Rx Java-like computational models, reactive programming models, in situations where you, you uh, want to take advantage of the features built into the lower levels of the Java concurrency models and parallelism models. Okay, so that's the end of the overview of Java 8 completable features.